I am very happy to be here today to talk about understanding and evaluating cloud storage services for personal digital archiving. And so you both know me, I'm Siobhan Hagen, and I am the Memory Lab Network Project Manager for DC Public Library. And so this is gonna be our May 2021 Memory Lab Network webinar. And I am really excited that Natalie Cadronell is actually gonna be joining us in about a, eh, now like 20 minutes um, to just talk about cloud storage and the secure mobile archiving app that she helped create called Save. So she's the, and she's the founder and director at Open Archive where they're the ones that created that. So we'll talk a little bit more about all of that in a, in a bit, but first, Let's talk about what the cloud is, because I think the, in this presentation today, there'll be a lot of kind of go, going over things that maybe we take for granted a little bit um, and just kind of reiterate what exactly does that mean again. So what is the cloud? The cloud is a term used to refer to storage, connectivity, and other infrastructure that belongs to someone else, so not yourself, uh, typically, but that you can access through the internet, typically for a fee. And, you know, I kind of like to think about how the internet once upon a time was called the World Wide Web, uh, or, and then they just kind of shortened it to the web. I don't know if anyone remembers that, I do. And I love how we use these terms like the web and the cloud, um, terms from nature to try and describe technology. I just think that's interesting. Uh, so using a cloud storage service is basically like you're paying rent to store stuff on someone else's servers. A server, can I go over that, is a computer or computer program that manages access to a centralized resource or, a, or service in a network of computers and uh, a network of users. A server's function is to store, retrieve, and send computer files and data to other computers on the network. The pandemic has really um, proven the importance of the cloud for remote work. And I'm kind of been just thinking about like remote screenings of movies for theaters and live performances and things like that. And of course, access to sensitive information securely, et cetera. This infographic is from NF the NSA's cloud security basics, and it illustrates the various forms that a cloud can take. So, and basically you don't have to fully understand what all of this means, uh, I don't. So uh, <laughs> but basically you can operate your own private cloud. So that's on the left there where everything is like the green or teal. Um, you can have your own private cloud if you have a lot of that like tech, technological skill and resources as well. And you're managing all of these aspects of that private cloud. And then the two in the middle are somewhere in between where you are manage some aspects of, of this and then others are managed by a cloud vendor. And then the last one on the right, that's all gray is where we're gonna be mostly talking about that aspect and where I think probably typically most people who will be coming into your memory lab will be asking about this cloud service where you have software as a service and that is managed completely by the cloud vendor. Some cloud services offer multiple layers of encryption and allow managers to set user controls. And this enables them to you know, choose who has access to the media on the cloud, as well as their level of access to the content. So you can have someone who can delete things and create things and, thing, and potentially then you can have some users that can't delete anything. So that's always better to have only one or a few people be able to do that. You could have the full control you know, over everything, um, but allow staffers or volunteers or um, family members, if you're dealing with personal archives, certain family members only have limited control. So maybe that you just want to have them like add metadata, like dates and people's names. 
And then uh, you could also potentially provide private links, you know, that expire to view a video or a photo or something like that. The cloud is many times more affordable than man maintaining a local server. It's relatively inexpensive over time due to this concept of economies of scale, which basically spreads the costs out amongst all the users of the service. And um, due to increasing the capacity, uh, it then brings the cost down for everybody. On the same token, it's cheaper and it's easier to use than managing your own server. You don't have to be an IT professional and have all of those skills and hardware uh, and resources really. So you just need the, you know, you just need a computer and you do need the internet, which can be a barrier obviously to, to many, but those are, you know, some, uh, those are the only things that you really need to um, ha have access to the cloud. Many times you get uh, also quality, hopefully you get quality tech support included in your service as well. So you could have access to that. And then for disadvantages of, of a cloud service, there are of course data breaches that happen, especially large companies are more likely to be targeted by hackers and, uh, to and will have these potential data breaches so, um, you know, in large companies with big servers that handle multiple tasks are also more susceptible to coding errors and other issues that are out of the control of the individuals or organizations that rely on them. You always also have to wait for service to do what you want. So you can't just do it yourself right away, right? Um, you're very dependent on the service to do things that you want to do. Similarly, similarly, the back end of the service is typically typically very obfuscated and, and not could be not very transparent about what is going on on the back end. Most people don't even know what to ask about what's going on in the back end, so it's it's not obvious. Um, but just what exactly are these services doing to ensure that your content is not lost and is accessible now and into the future? And then how will you get your content out of these proprietary systems when either you can't pay anymore, you miss a payment, or you know, what if the company goes bankrupt or something like that? So we'll talk more about that in detail in a little bit. While these advantages and disadvantages are the same for everyone really, it's important to evaluate cloud services according to what user you know, hat you're, you're wearing especially as archivists for us, um, when you're working with your collections and thinking about using the cloud for archival storage versus, you know, your personal archives at home and you're looking and evaluating a cloud storage service for those. So I just kind of, we're going to be talking about these three um, types of users today, mostly focusing on personal archives. Um, so the first is archival organizations, and that's more archives. So things like our, per, our people's archive at DC Public Library, or any sort of special collections at a university, or standalone archives, very specifically archival organizations that have archivists that are trained in, um, you know, archival theory and archival best practices. Then we have organizations with archives. So this is more like businesses that then have their own internal archives that they would like to keep and have access to into the future. And then of course we have personal archives, which many, everyone has, and it's all about their um, archives with, at, in their homes and um, dealing with their like personal lives and families and memories that we are working to help them preserve. So I have a little, you know, start at the end uh, where all of these users can potentially and most likely do have sensitive material in them. And that is something that we'll talk a little bit more about, especially with Natalie once she joins us. Um, so sensitive material could be things, mostly things that you want to keep more secure than other things. So uh, that's really the kind of lens that I'd like to look at it through for evaluating a cloud service. And so the organization Open Archive that Natalie created um, and founded 
They recently wrote a really great blog post focusing on cloud services for folks who have more highly sensitive material, like I mentioned, and, and their um, particular example that they give is like human rights activists, uh, also whistleblowers, media organizations, legal advocates working within this human rights activist, uh, you know, world. So Open Archive is an organization that conducts research and collaborates with human rights defenders and then at-risk communities. And they're working to create responsive, secure, and ethical archiving technologies, specifically for mobile media, so for our phones, our smartphones. They've created an app for your smartphone called SAVE, which, shares, uh, which stands for Share, Archive, Verify, and Encrypt. And this app helps citizen reporters and eyewitnesses around the world to preserve, protect, authenticate, and amplify what they've documented on their phone. So these tips here are from their blog post, which there's a link in there to the slides, which I will um, send to everyone in Slack. These tips um, are coming from the user perspective, as I mentioned, of human rights act activists with sensitive material. So it's gonna be potentially a little bit different for personal archives that won't have this type of human rights activists materials in them. But it's just a really great resource I wanna point out um, for you all. And you can learn also way more about Open Archive, the organization, the why and how it started the mobile app called Save. And from this Memory Lab Network webinar that we recorded in February, way back in February of 2019 now. And this was a webinar with, with Natalie, specifically Open Archive's founder, and who will be joining us in a few minutes. So it's super interesting and just like you get a little bit more relevant uh, or you get more information on this. And it's just amazing how over the years, um, their work has become more and more relevant in the more of like a public sphere with the passing of time. I think it's only gonna get more relevant. And I mean, you know, I, I really, we all have activists in our local community. So um, I do recommend giving this a watch to be able to help um, your activists in your local community more. And so I'm really looking forward to Natalie joining us in a little bit. And once again, let's clear up some terminology and not take this stuff for granted. There's so many terms that you'll see floating around cloud service vendor websites. So I just want to go over some of those that you'll probably see the most right now. Generally speaking, the quicker you want to have access to your content and your data in the cloud, the more expensive the service will be. So that's an important thing to remember. And then hot and online terms like that, that, that means you want and that you would get access to your data very quickly and easily, and it's gonna cost you more money. Nearline is in the middle. It's a compromise between uh, you know, online very fast and then offline very slow data storage. And then that leads us into, of course, the offline, um, and that's cold. Also, they call it cold, cold line, dark, uh, those types of, that type of ter terminology. So this means it'll take a while to retrieve your data after you requested it. Um, and then um, another term at the end is enterprise. And unfortunately, we're not referring to Star Trek, which I wish we were, but um, enterprises are generally considered large corporations that manage hundreds or thousands, really, even of employees. These organizations typically have very large budgets that allow them to be relatively flexible with their technology spending. So therefore, enterprises will usually seek out a top shelf product that's designed to be a comprehensive solution to the typical problems that their size of a business will face. So a lot of times you'll see um, cloud storage services say we have enterprise solutions and enterprise software and things like that. And that's basically what they mean. So they're not, um, uh, they'll, they'll, it, this is less something to do with personal digital archiving. Let's always reiterate this with our public what is the difference between data backup and data archiving? Because I, it, it gets very murky in within the cloud service um, vendor and uh, marketing that they put out there. 
So the difference is, um, and that you are going to want to highlight regularly that there is a difference to the public, because I think many times they don't even know, um, is that data backups are designed for the rapid recovery of, you know, regularly used data, while da data archiving stores your data that's no longer in day, you know, day to day use, um, but still must be retained. And the backup means that you'll as I said, recover items quickly. And usually with archiving, it that's not something that you really need. The speed of recovery um, and access is, is less important. So, you know, kind of thinking ways that you can explain this to your public are thinking of, of your mobile phone. And, you know, do you, I have an iPhone, right? So I do have iCloud and that backs up my phone, including my texts. I have my texts on there and I have, I think I pay like $2 a month, <laughs> but, um, and has my texts and my photos, videos, my contacts, everything gets backed up. But then, um, you know, I can't just delete something in my phone and then hope that it stays in the, uh, in iCloud. It's not, it's going to get deleted off of iCloud as well. So, um, that is kind of where, the difference is, is that it's just a backup of my phone. Um, I can't like delete something on my phone to create more physical space and then save it on, on the, on the iCloud. Right. So that's where it's, it's a backup. It's, it's not an archive. So, um, that might be the easiest way to describe the difference to your public. If anyone can think of others, let me know once we're done. Other tech technology terminology are, uh, <laughs> In these acronyms that you'll probably see, the first one is VM, which stands for virtual machine. And that's uh, ba basically a virtual version of a computer. So it dedicates amounts of so your CPU memory storage that's borrowed from your actual computer that you're working on. So your personal computer or your work computer and uh, or a remote server even. And basically it works and behaves the virtual machine works as an as a actual computer on that computer but it it's separate it can run uh, in a window as a separate separate computing environment often to run a different operating system a lot of times people use virtual machines for um like emulating older software so that um that one webinar that we did with ethan gates about software emulation talks about vir using virtual machines to run that that older um, software in the way that it was supposed to, to run on that type of like operating system, um, older operating system. So a virtual machine is something that you'll, you'll hear of in sometimes, especially once you're getting more into um, the technical end of uh, cloud service, cloud storage service. And um, then VPS stands for virtual private server, which is a virtual machine sold as a service by a vendor, basically. Um, so don't have to know too much about that, but it's knowing what a virtual machine is helps. <laughs> and then there's a NAS and a SAN, and those are related to each other. Some, they're very similar, but also very different. A uh, NAS stands for network attached storage, and then SAN stands for storage area network. They're both networks that make data available to multiple users. They just go about doing that very differently. So as a Quick overview, NAS is a single storage device that serves files over the ethernet. And then, um, and it's relatively inexpensive and easy to set up, easier to set up <laughs> than a SAN, which is tightly coupled network of multiple devices. And that's more expensive and you need to have more um, technology skills because it's more complex to manage and to set up. This here is a, these links are great resources from AVP, which is a well-respected vendor who does um, pr and provides data management solutions to archives and libraries and individuals and companies. But um, this, these wonderful resources were published way back in 2014. And the most up-to-date, it has um, some cloud storage ven vendor profiles um on there but the last one looks like it was updated in 2017 so that was a while ago now uh but it's still a really useful 
the, the top one is assessing cloud storage, like a it's a paper, white paper, I believe. And then the vendor profiles basically like kind of takes what they lay out there and applies it to certain cloud storage vendors. And um, it's just really helpful to see how they applied the things that they talk about have how you assess a cloud storage vendor and then like seeing how that gets applied to it is really interesting. So while those vendor profiles might not be updated exactly um, and might not be, um, you might wanna update, you know, use their guide and update uh, the profile yourself. But um, basically like these are just uh, great resources for you all to potentially learn more, but we're actually, going to, and I saw that Natalie joined us. Hi, Natalie. Hey, everyone. Hey. Um, so I'm still going through the lecture, so bear with me. I'll try and keep it quick, but. <laughs> oh, no, go for it. I'm glad I could catch some. Cool, cool. Thanks for joining us. All right. So um, just want to talk about things that I pulled from that resource that I just showed you all, the AVP's resource uh, for assessing vendor your um, cloud storage vendors. And um, these are things that, you know, I want to highlight for, I pulled out things from the resource that I want to highlight for folks with personal archives and that are considering um, cloud services to, to store and preserve them. I really relied heavily on that AVP document. So just, um, but I was just trying to make it more understandable and focus on the needs of the public for their personal digital archives. Um, so the first thing, really that you want to think about is um, evaluating in evaluating cloud storage services is it's all about asking the right questions you know and it's, what are the necessary functions that your cloud sort service needs to do for you what does a company need to have or to do in order for you to trust them with your personal archive overall it's really bad to assume anything when you're working with third-party services so that's just in general, whether it's cloud service or social media, anything like that. So always read the fine print. And something that I'm going to pull out from the AVP resource that they say is uninformed decisions risk loss of time, money, and even assets. And that is very true for personal archiving as well. There's unfortunately no perfect solution, no all-in-one out-of-the-box solution that you're going to get. So you need to come up with, you know, what are your red flags and your boundaries that you don't want to cross? And then make sure that you get what you want in writing from the service. They have uh, these different sort of areas of evaluating the service. So the first place that AVP starts in their document is defining your requirements. So you should start with asking yourself some questions first. What role will the services play? Like, will it be, you know, one of your three storage copies or maybe it's a backup, maybe you do want a backup and it's just a backup of, of your laptop or something. Or maybe I'll just store my archive of photos but not my home movies. How often do you need access to those materials um, that you're gonna put in, in the cloud? And then who do you want to have access to that? Is it just gonna be you? Is it maybe a spouse and other family members, et cetera? So there are a bunch of other questions that I'm kind of just going to roll through here um, that I pulled from that document. So how quickly, as we already mentioned, how quickly do you need access to your materials? And do the other people within your um, who are having access to the cloud service, do they, how quickly do they need access? Could you wait a few days or weeks even? Do you have any security needs or issues? for information in your archive. How much storage do you need now? And then how much do you anticipate needing over the next five years or so? Do you care about what types of storage the company uses for their, store, for their servers? Do you care about geographic separation for the servers and backups? What's your budget now and what will it be in the long term? So think about those five to 10 years. And what level of comfort do you have in your knowledge to conduct you know, preservation on your own or aspects of preservation on your own? Related to that is what level of technical knowledge do you have in general? And just be honest with yourself about that and what you actually feel like you have the resources to do on your own. Are you using cloud services for any other reasons or part of your life? Maybe you could work with that company on your storage. 
it is typically best to assess the vendor, not the service. You want a viable, mature company with a high level of satisfied customers. So ask yourself how many years has the vendor been providing this service and ask the vendor that. Will the company be financially viable in five years? Really think about that and kind of look at its past. What about 10 years from now? How do you get in touch then with the customer service? What is the turnaround time for that? Or what do they say in their policy um, versus potentially what maybe you read in a review from a user? How big is their user base and what types of users are they typically? So, um, you know, do they do archives of all sizes? Are they mostly personal archiving? Are they doing that enterprise solutions for very large companies? And then does the language they use to describe their service demonstrate that they understand digital preservation? How does the company offer support? Are there separate support plans that you have to pay more for? Is there a telephone number or just like a general contact form on their web page to get in contact with support? And what's the turnaround time for support as well, not just customer service, but then um, your, you know, your tech support. Are the terms and conditions or fine print, right? The absolute, the, that fine print, is that, is it reasonable and acceptable to you? And also, do you understand it? Is it written in, in language that's very confusing? The next bucket uh, to evaluate the vendor is storage hardware management. So this is where you focus on how they adhere to basic digital preservation principles. And uh, I'm just going to refer back to that, you know, pre in person boot camp lecture that we had about digital preservation principles um, that we have out there. Uh, and that webinar is on the memory lab network YouTube page as well. So, you know, this will be evaluating how they manage their hardware, where ideally they should be replicating materials in geographically separate locations, monitoring the health of all of their hardware and the age of their hardware. And most that's like three to five years tops. And then they need to regularly update their hardware and migrate the data from one piece of hardware to the next. Remember, don't assume they do any of this. Don't assume anything. So you need to ask them, is data backed up and redundant across to at least two geographically separate data centers? Where are those centers located? What are the storage types used and how do you update hardware? And how do you migrate your data? How often do you update the hardware? What checks are done when data is migrated? Can I get the results of migrate, migration reported to me? Do they own and maintain their own servers and hardware, or do they provide this service through another provider like Amazon? It's a really important one. There should be lots of transparency in the management of your data and how the service, the vendor um, operates. The less transparent of the data management, then the less trustworthy they are. At the minimum, they should be able to deliver back to you exactly what you put in, right? The main element to this is maintaining and confirming the integrity of your data over time or fixity. And so questions to ask to figure this out are, are any changes made to the files when they are ingested into the system? For example, this could be used when they're encrypting something. Do they ensure the integrity of your data over time? How do they ensure it and how do they do this? How often do they do it? What happens if the integrity fails? How do they track and monitor all of this? And if they do, which they should, will that then be reported back to you? Do they comply with any standards or certifications? So an example of that is ISO 16363. Not totally necessary to have a certification or a standard, but it's just another factor to look into and ask them uh, in building a, you know, a trustworthy uh, relationship. Reporting in metadata is also really important. We've kind of mentioned it already, but getting regular reports with metadata and information about your archive has an impact on the resources required to have ongoing access and preservation. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've mentioned a few times uh, in various other sections, but it's so important that it needs to be mentioned on its own. We don't want to just forget about um, metadata. So you need to ask regularly what reports and logs are available to me as a client. What metadata is 
generated during storage. For example, if they create checksums, um, where are they? Where is that metadata stored? And how do I have access to that? Am I getting a report? Am I have? Do I have access to logs uh, and other things like that? And then, like, how do I get access? A big factor um, for your service uh, is the performance, and it's really mainly like, do you want this service for access or preservation mostly, and or do you want both? Right, you can have both. So if you want access to things quickly and easily, it's going to cost you more money. So and, and those questions you need to ask to get to the bottom of that uh, of the performance of the services. Uh, what's the max bandwidth permitted for delivery to or from the service? How many users do you need requesting access? Um, you personally, uh, and how many you know can they permit access to it? How many staff members on their end will be accessing and have what types of access will they have? Is there a limit for how many concurrent users can be accessing your data at once? So let's say the whole fam gets in there and tries to look at photos at the same time. Is that possible or is that not possible? What types of files will each user need access to? Photos, videos, and then what types of access do they need? So do they need to be able to download it or can they just view it only or stream if it's a video? How does the service provide access to end users? So is, does it allow streaming? Does it allow embed codes? How long are you willing to wait for access and retrieval? And what are the charges then associated with that? And usually, you know, if you want it quicker, you're gonna have to pay more. Is there a limit for how much data you can retrieve in a month at no additional charge? And then what do you pay after that limit is reached? Make sure that if you have sensitive information in your materials that it's handled appropriately. This can be done through encryption uh, is, is one way. Consider the impact of various security mechanisms on, your, on the performance of the service and on permissions as well. So that's just something to think about. It has an effect on other aspects of uh, the service. So questions you wanna ask first, of course, that you kind of already asked was, ask yourself is, do you have sensitive information in your materials that needs extra protection? Um, what security protocols does the vendor have in place for this type of material? And then who is responsible for doing that? What security standards do they comply with and what certifications do they have? Uh, an example is ISO 270001. And you could potentially just, if they have any, just Google it and see what it says um, because I don't expect anybody to just know what that is off the top of their head. And then can you manage your own encryption? Is there support within the um, service for you to do that type of uh, management of your own encryp encryption? So security is more to prevent hacking and then disaster and recovery is for the security of your data in case of like disaster of, as they say, man-made, human-made or an act of God type of disasters. So, you know, you wanna focus on what kind of infrastructure they have in place for this. And you need to ask them, you know, is there a replicated copy of your data in the event of a disaster? What are the protocols for loss of data? What does it say in the service agreement when uh, about loss of data? So make sure that it says something about it. Who gets contacted how and when exactly during a disaster or even a potential disaster? How much time is there between when you get them your data and when it's backed up? in case there's an emergency within that time. Um, how long will it take to recover your data? Should there be a disaster with the, the main storage? And then you need, as we've mentioned over and over, it's really the gist is you need to get back what you put in exactly as you put it in there, including the metadata that's generated while your data is in their system. Um, but you need to understand where there might be extra hidden costs in this terminating of service with a um, vendor. So make sure everything is clearly documented in detail and ask questions like, what happens if the vendor no longer supports this service, right? And or goes out of business. That's very important to think about. How will your materials be returned to you if you terminate service or the service is terminated? How much will the, then this cost you financially? What actions 
lead to termination of service um, other than you ending it? Um, and how do they, they manage it? So for example, if you, maybe it's after two unpaid bills, you know, if they charge you monthly after two, will they contact you via email or, or phone? And will they give you at least 60 days after the last end, you know, unpaid bill before they delete your uh, account or whatever like that. So you need to figure out all of those details about your uh, terminating and your end of service. So now I'm gonna talk about some vendors, but these lists are not exhaustive at all. And I'm not necessarily recommending these vendors. We're just trying to provide knowledge uh, to you, to the public, to evaluate these vendors and providers so that then you can, um, and, and our you know, users at the Memory Lab can make these decisions for themselves. It's nice though, right, to have someone offer some names to start with because there's just sometimes so many out there, it's so overwhelming. Um, so I wanted to mention some um, free to low cost storage solutions that answer many of the questions we asked before in, in positive ways. And um, the first one is permanent.org. We did a webinar earlier this year with the executive director there. Um, so I included that link as well as the link to permanent.org. And they do have fees. Their model is interesting in that they're a nonprofit organization and they, they really focus on their endowment, um, which increases personally my level of trust that they'll be able to sustain themselves and that uh, you know hardware uh, and migration of data over time so you can learn more about the specifics of that in their webinar. We talk about that a lot. The Internet Archive is also a nonprofit and you can actually upload content there for free. So that's a great free option, but uh, you know, there's no options for privacy. Everything that you upload there is out in and open for all to, to view, not just view, but also download. They keep at least two copies on separate servers. They're also very well funded. Um, they automatically generate checksums when you up, uh, upload your files. So your integrity, you have some aspect and metadata that's added and you have access to those as well. Um, so the, those are some important things to think about. And then I've already mentioned SAVE, which we're gonna talk about with Natalie here in just a little bit, um, but just keep this in mind for personal archives with sensitive materials and information more from the human rights and activist community. And I have the link to the webinar in there that we did in 2019. The main um, thing I want to also point out for vendors for personal archives is um, file sharing is not archival storage. So, you know, vendors like Dropbox, which the main, you know, Dropbox does a lot of other things now, but the main point of Dropbox and other um, services like Box um, are good for file sharing, but they're not archival storage at all. So we really need to reiterate this with um, the public. Uh, in how in evaluating the what is archival storage, what is backup, what is just a temporary file sharing option uh, through the cloud. So same with you know just doing a backup as I mentioned before. So um, always also reiterate because this is just something that get, has gotten stuck in the public's mindset is that um, social media is not archival storage you're not going to upload something to Facebook and get back what you uploaded because they're compressing your photos and videos and everything and then they're messing with your your metadata. Um, and so just it's not archival storage, you're going to need a separate solution. These are some vendors and there's so many more out there that do uh, very specific things with the cloud. I just want to kind of mention so you know that that these things are out there the first and also you'll probably get um, questions about what should I do with photos, right, um, from potentially either hobbyists or professional photographers. And I like to mention Photo Shelter, and this focuses specifically on photographs. Uh, it only works with photographs. So um, just keep that in mind. You can use it as cloud storage, archival storage for your preservation masters, but then you can also use it to create like an online portfolio and a database of, of your photos with all of the metadata and things like that. The other vendor I want to mention is LucidLink, which leverages cloud-based storage with, um, you know, higher functionality that you would expect from hardware that you're working directly on. Of course, they say oh, only this is better. So basically, you can not just use their storage for your archive, um, and you can even hook up with other cloud storage archival solutions with them. But their main thing with working is that they're working in the cloud, so you can easily, supposedly more affordably, access your data 
quickly and then work from work off of the cloud. So this is you're using this in more like high quality video editing if you're video editing with like 4k and you want to edit in the cloud. Um, also with storing like video surveillance footage and then a, a very quick recall on that as well or, or access to it retrieval. So they're calling this an active archive because there's that, you know, it's more hot storage. It's a, that like very rapid access to their archive. And this is particularly useful in light of the pandemic and this like move to remote work. Um, so just wanted to let you guys know about those options. And there are some vendors that are very specifically geared towards archival organizations um, and are just specifically archives. So these vendors are, um, you know, really uh, focused on our archivists and what archivists want. And I'm not going to really go into the much. I have the links here, but I just wanted to list them so you can see that there's like very specific cloud storage vendors out there for this very specific user set. And there are so many more vendors out there for organizations like businesses with their internal archives. And you can look these up um, for uh, I'm sure they also offer options for personal archiving too, but just wanted to kind of think of them more as those like enterprise solutions that we talked about. And, you know, you can just do some comparing and contrasting about what these all do. Um, but I just wanted to show that there are so many and um, yeah, so many and some I'm sure you've heard of many I haven't even heard of. The cloud services section uh, from the Digital Preservation Coalition's Digital Preservation Handbook has lots more, you know, pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of cloud services um, in, in there uh, with lots of details. And so I wanted to share this additional resource with you all to read. And really the other thing that's great about this resource is their list of further resources at the end that I felt like it, it really covers everything. So if you want to do an even further deep dive into cloud storage, that's great. And thank you all for listening to me talk about the cloud for so long. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and um, invite Natalie to pop on and um, Hey, all I'm sorry I missed the beginning, but I'm very glad to be included in this great talk and I've learned a lot myself. So um, as someone who's been working on the front end of preservation for mobile, it's really challenging to find the right back end that's also accessible. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know um, how much you covered about like what SAVE is. Um, Snowden, I, I have met you at a couple of MIAs and I think maybe Jonathan, but I'm not sure. So, you know, I can give a little overview if that's useful to start mm -hmm. and talk about where our cloud decisions came from, from like the folks we work with. I think what you said was so right on. It's like our needs are all so different. And I think for me, we're always threat modeling for more at risk and marginalized groups than like the average archivist would be. And I think focusing on born digital makes things a little bit easier in a way because we're not really ingesting any analog into our archives. So we're just focusing on the mobile to archive process and initially open archive was conceived when I was at UC Berkeley School of Information in 2011 to 13. And we were able to get a little bit of funding in 2014 to build a prototype, which essentially was our first app that was called Open Archive to just send stuff to the Internet Archive. And there were various reasons why this was good for activists in many countries like Iran, Sudan, and some other places. Google was blocked, so people couldn't upload their videos and photos to YouTube or any many places on the web. but Internet Archive was not blocked because no one knew what it was. <laughs> so people were able to start publishing what was going on in these kind of blackout countries with, um, and I don't mean internet blackouts, I mean um, restricted web, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they just, there was just this flourishing of information being shared on Internet Archive. And one of the reasons we like the Internet Archive for at-risk media is that it's actually kind of hard to trace it back to who posted. All you need is an email to join. And a lot of these folks are pretty seasoned activists, so they always had these throwaway emails that they never used anywhere else. So that gave them a layer of protection versus posting on non-archival places like social media or where Dropbox, wherever. 
And so after um, working with these groups for a few years, it became very clear that we needed a much more secure option. But, you know, a lot of people weren't really uh, comfortable with encryption and privacy and the usability of that stuff was really nascent. And so, you know, this is what, 2015. And I think that um, the, the priority for us was like, okay, well, we need to have at least one private backend that people can access. But again, we don't provide the storage. We just provide the kind of interface to make it easy. And, and we also were like, well, we need many more features to protect people, but to protect them, the metadata and the media itself. And what was cool is I was working with the folks at Guardian Project who had created Proof Mode and Witness had worked with that before with Camera V and Obscura Cam and all these different, um, I'm sorry, InformaCam is what Proof Mode was used for, but there were all these great tools. They were just really hard to use. And that adds a lot of metadata that's kind of pulled in from the sensors of the phone that helps corroborate the EXIF data and makes it harder to you know, fake the media later. What's also great about the tools that we, the, the features we incorporated into what is now Save, what used to be Open Archive, is that you're able to add a SHA-256 hash to each file so you can then better yeah, have chain of custody and verification. And so this comes into play specifically when you're trying to use media as evidence, which is historically been very challenging. And even with the perfect amount of metadata and proof and verification and chain of custody, a lot of media is not considered um, viable in courts of law. So I actually consulted with a number of human rights lawyers internationally, since standards are really different between countries, on like, what can we do to be the best uh, as, you know, give you the most useful media as possible. And so that's how we develop kind of um, how we decided on these features. So now that we had this more robust app that could send things to the Internet Archive, and now we decided like a private service, choosing that service was kind of challenging. Um, we did not want to use Amazon. We wanted to find a server service that allowed you to have local servers as well. We came up with those guidelines, which may or may not have been in the presentation, Javon, I didn't see them, but maybe they were there, where when choosing a server for human rights archiving, there are certain standards, like you wanna make sure it's open source, so you can look at the code and make sure that it's safe. You wanna make sure that they're committed to privacy and that they have at least one layer of encryption, if not three, which is much better, and there are ways to do this on the back end in transit through the app another feature is that we send everything over tls or transport layer security and if you have android you can also send it over tor so we're trying to kind of nail the front end security piece and we really needed a back end to mirror that level of security or even enhance it further and we came up with um, nextcloud as our preferred kind of private server because not only can you have your own local server if you want for free they they give you the software you just have to have the hardware and the cap you know capacity but they offer encrypted triple encrypted storage for you in the cloud and it's a really nice interface. I like their backend. When you log in, you can see all your folders. You can see where everything is. It's very easy to organize. You can control access. So you can give people varied access at different levels. So you can have managers and like contributors only. Most of what it, you know, what we do is have like um, a write only kind of uh, like a set up for like many people to have right only access, you know, and then they push everything up. And then there's like an organization, let's say Human Rights Watch, who's, you know, incorporating this into their workflow will then receive everything and manage everything internally and have different levels on the back end to see everything that's coming in and organize it, which makes it kind of easy for contributors because you can just send them a QR code and it'll link to your server and they don't know, they don't need to, they can't access it any other way, but they can send you files. Mm -hmm. Um, so for them, they use it with videographers and witness testimonials, things like that. And, um, and I think the, the last piece of the server bit is that Nextcloud has a lot of partners that run their servers that add extra features on it. So you can kind of get a tailor-made, you know, or like a tailor-made server for your needs. So we also like the good cloud, which runs Nextcloud instances and adds like extra support and integration with other services. So, you know, you can even create like databases within there and contactless, they almost have a CRM, right? So there's like a whole other level to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, and, and also Nextcloud is really trusted in the human rights community. They come to the RightsCon conferences, they come and they invest and they support. And so 
you know, it's, it took a lot of experience to kind of figure out what, what the right thing is. And they're stable, they're well-funded, they have a great business model. You can pay for their services and pay for storage, of course. And um, the costs aren't prohibitive at all. And I think with, um, yeah, with going forward, I'm always scanning to try and find better places. They're not specifically for archives. They're not going to pay as much attention as an archival focused service. They're going to, you know, let, be lacking in some ways in, in the archival field. So it's really for us by prioritizing privacy, we in a way had to a little bit deprioritize some of um, our archival needs. And so that's always a tension that we're trying to kind of figure out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that you just mentioned things that like, this is such a great case study in evaluating uh, <laughs> service, the cloud storage services and really vendors, because that's <laughs> what um, the AVP resource really uh, highlighted was you are evaluating the vendor, not necessarily the service or first yeah. and foremost is really evaluating the vendor, which you just did where you're like, they are trusted, their yeah. community, which is the user that you're thinking of and that you're working with. And yeah. your, you know, your and what your main needs were within that community and when you're wearing that hat is the security aspect. So it's yeah. not one there's never gonna be like a perfect solution. Yeah. But, Identifying trade-offs. That's like a huge yeah. part of all of our processes, right? So absolutely. And I think it's gonna be a big thing for um for personal archives for people looking for that storage. Yeah. Well, the good news is that you don't have to trade off usability for privacy as much as you used to, which is where I'm really thrilled That's after all these years. It was it was really privacy or accessibility. There was no I mean, privacy or usability. There was like no middle ground. It was either and when or. you say usability. Can you explain like what? You oh, yeah. Like, that? for example, encrypted communications were really challenging to to set up. Like I've been using Signal since it was called Red Phone in 2010, when five of my friends who built it were on it and that was it and it was so janky and even till like 2018 it would crash a lot of my I tried to get my friends to join it's the only way I communicate and have been for a decade and it was just so frustrating so as far as being usable it really wasn't very usable and it turned a lot of people off but I was so committed to privacy I didn't care and I just stuck with it and now here we are now where everyone's joined Signal after four years of Trump. And I think people in America have now had a taste. Um, I'm based in Portland, y'all. And I, uh, I moved up from the Bay Area. And last summer was a revelation for many Americans around the lack of privacy because they, they didn't know they needed to be private. And that was kind of the first instance with the BLM movement that people realized just how serious this had gotten um, here. And of course, um, you know, that that was nice that we didn't have to make a trade off for usability when using things like signal and it's even but it extends to many other tools now that are just defaulting to, you know, very private um, practices and, and that took a lot of time and there just wasn't money, um, you know, all the best. <laughs> functions of our society are so underfunded. And so that's one of the main reasons. So I've been just screaming at the, you know, universe for years, like throw funding at civic tech, we deserve this, this is the web we built and wanted. And this is now our, not our reality. And you know, this is for the people, this is protecting our privacy rights, our Fourth Amendment rights, like, wh like, where is the freaking money? <laughs> and so I think it's there now. I think it's really gotten, yeah, a lot better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, this is where it's really great to be seeing more, not saying there's tons, but like no. more, um, uh, you know, offerings like, like save, um, and that are, and other things, like I mentioned, like permanent.org yeah. is, is another, so like, uh, you know, diff more for personal archives. And I mean, the internet archive has been around for so long, but also like thinking of these yeah. other platforms, um, that are very like tech, tech based, um, but mm -hmm. then they focus, there's so much focus on, on archiving. Um, mm -hmm. even if, like you said, like you guys might not be, you might have to throw, you know, some things out that yeah. are digital preservation, best practices, which we do all the time with personal yeah. archiving, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like we can't yeah. do best practices. So, um, like, yeah, it's just all about like what's doable. Right. Mm -hmm. and then, so, but it's, it's just so nice to see that people are still considering it it's not like they're just not even thinking about it. they're just like well we've thought about it here's what we can do here yeah. you know and then also making it very user friendly so yes. that's the thing that i've been really excited about because so many things that work for archives and archivists 
you know, uh, thinking yeah. about like software tools, open source tools uh, yeah. are not user friendly. And even if there is like a GUI graphical user interface for mm -hmm. the software and the tool, it's still not um, yeah. intuitive to use or down. Yeah. Or Usability takes a lot of iterating and time. And I'm lucky because I've been doing my PhD DIY with um, lots of amazing communities and doing this really deep ethnographic research and iteration with the tool over 10 years. It's a long, slow process. But it was really understanding what they had trouble with, with the app, with the concepts, with, so we have all these great educational materials now we got to, you know, we got enough funding to really focus on the outreach piece. And I think the training and education side is really important, but it can't be so hard that you need more than, you know, 20, 30 minutes of training. So there's that balance. And obviously when you have like the one idea we had with save would be to have like personal digital archiving days at libraries where people just come in and they have all this media local footage and whatever and they want to send it to the internet archive and it's such an easy way to do it off your phone mm -hmm. and so that's less about privacy and more about community collections and so having yeah like having an app on your phone where your media is to be able to do this was really the impetus for all of this originally before mm -hmm. all of, you know and then it became clear that a lot of this media that I was making my friends and other folks who were citizen journalists and activists really didn't necessarily belong there, but there needed to be somewhere to go. So. Yeah, there was such, there's such a need for yeah. what you created, like, yeah, and um, <laughs> is it, can I, is it free? Like, how do you? So yeah, I, I honestly just like want to, so I did this seven minute like instructional tutorial for RightsCon, which I, I'm, pre or it's being presented because it's like not live in a week and a half. And I really want to share that with you after I'm not allowed to before, but no. I also have like a really cool, there's the, oh, let me find it. There's this great thing, but basically save is totally free open source funded by foundations. Like it's never been, um, we, we can't charge for services because we're not doing anything <laughs> like we made the tool and now you use it, you control your archive, you choose a server. Um, funny enough, we do connect to Dropbox just because we figured, well, a lot of people have Dropbox accounts, so why not? We need to, you know, offer more services, but ultimately we're going the way of interplanetary file systems or distributed storage which is a whole new thing and um i won't get into that now but i i think it'll be really exciting to see how we can somehow integrate privacy with blockchain because that's going to be a big challenge and it's also a really good way to have so many copies on so many servers and really provide the robust preservation that's super decentralized that we've always dreamt of having and it's kind of within reach now which is super exciting um, I'm going to share this guide real fast. Um, it's very you, recent. Can you share your screen or are you going to put it in the chat? I'm going to put it in the chat, but okay. um, I could share my screen. Okay, let me just make sure that I've given you multiple. I think you It should. says I can. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. So that'll be useful. Um, let's see if it works. Hey, there it is. Yeah. Um, okay, so quick overview. Um, SAVE is actually an acronym that stands for Share, Archive, Verify, and Encrypt, which are four features that SAVE offers, but it also offers the ability to Creative Commons your media before sending it, which is cool for us, because then we know what people want us to do with it. <laughs> um, and so uh, let's see how useful this guide is, actually. So it kind of explains who it's for. We already talked about that. And then, you know, what you'd want to save, and obviously it's a lot of activist media or sensitive media, and why you want to preserve it and what the downfalls with social media are. And then here's the cool part where there's lots of little QR codes where you can just download the app. And so it's, it's great because it's for Android, it's kind of where we're going with iOS, but because development always takes way longer than we expect, we don't have two really key features yet for iOS, which would be proof mode, which adds that extra sensor data, and Orbot, which is Tor for Android right now, but it's the Onion router, which essentially um, a, like obfuscates and obscures the um, media in transit by sending it to many different nodes before it reaches its final destination. So no one can really intercept it because it's not all together there. And I, I don't want to get into the Onion router too much, but it is a privacy tool um, originally made by the Navy 
that is now taken over by activists and human rights defenders and continued on and allows you to browse the, the web anonymously. It's kind of like an in-browser VPN in a way where it masks your, um, your IP address and uh, other aspects that people can use to trace media back to you by hopping on all these different servers that are distributed by volunteers that are distributed around the, the world. So that for Android, exists it's in process uh with ios we will hopefully have something soon can but regardless uh, <laughs> um sorry uh, someone asked in the chat if you can get the app in the app store yeah it's in the the app store and google play i'm sorry if i just like butchered the tour definition i just want to oh, let you know no, it's like totally, a, i think view. we all we need is like a overview just to understand the purpose of it you know yeah, yeah. so yeah, so um, so for iOS and for Android, it has all the features you would need as an archivist to kind of ingest this media because it lets you see the um, the intent of the creator with the Creative Commons licensing. It organizes everything into collection folders. So like if you download, save, and you want to send things to different people. So you want to send something to, I don't know, Library of Congress, or you want, and they have to have a server that you can connect to. Um, you could do that while also sending stuff to the Internet Archive or Dropbox or any other server that is WebDAV compatible. And that the WebDAV compatible piece is why we chose NextCloud um, and why we made it WebDAV compatible. It kind of all happened at the same time. So there are lots of WebDAV compatible type servers like NextCloud. But again, a lot of people who have servers don't have that capacity and can't use save yet with their potential proprietary servers. So these are all things to take into consideration. What should we um, look for in the, in the, let's say, um, if we're, I'm on my. Oh yeah. Save is such a ubiquitous term. You have to look for open archives. Okay. Open, um, open. So if you go to the app store, you can download it. If you go to Google play, if you look for open archive, it should be the first hit. Um, but if you all put in word. save, I doubt you'll find it. <laughs> okay, so I just looked open archive all one word and I found Yeah, it. all one word. Yeah. It's it's a silly I you know, Bay Area thing to make it one word, but it also makes it a lot easier to find. Right. And and it you can um <laughs> SEO. to the internet archive, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can use it. So actually maybe what I should do is share <laughs> different slides. Give me one sec, okay? Sure, yeah. If I can do this, if you have like five minutes. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me share this. It's for RightsCon, so it can't be shared with anyone else, but it at least, um, okay, wait. So how do, I guess I have to stop the share and reshare. Okay, here we go. Okay, so it's not gonna look pretty because I'm in like the view thing, but yeah. um, I actually give a nice little overview of how it works, which actually I pulled from my EMEA slides from <laughs> last EMEA. <laughs> so this may be up somewhere already, but uh, I can also share this after RightsCon again yeah, in like- That would be great, yeah. Of yeah. course. Um, so you can choose right now, and Dropbox isn't here because this was before we integrated Dropbox, but you can choose private web dev server or internet archive. You already have to have an account on the private server, but you can actually set up an account at the internet archive through the app. And it's not super duper intuitive and we're working on that usability and I blame the Internet Archive because <laughs> we've done everything we can. But what you can do is you can get to the Internet Archive's page. They ask you to log in. If you have a login, great. If you don't, you can set one up and then you kind of have to go back and acquire these keys to sync it with save. That's the most challenging part, I think, of the whole app. Um, and so then you they populate automatically after you acquire the keys and then you're good to go. And you can also have, there's like global settings that help people who are in low connectivity areas, which doesn't apply so much to the states, but you can decide like how, you know, what quality you want to use. And you could also choose if you want to upload only on Wi-Fi if you have expensive cell, you know, data plans like most people in the world do. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, the way to stay, to, to actually create the, the folders on the servers is that you can either map to one that already exists. So if it's like a private server or even I think, an Internet Archive folder that you've made already, you can then just keep adding stuff to it. And if you know, you're a large organization that's ingesting lots of mobile, it's great because then you can just like have that, you know, set up. So you're sending people QR codes that automatically link to that folder. So it gives them their login and everything. So they're already kind of just linked into you. If you're the only one that they're sharing media with, that's easy. And even if you're not, they can add other servers if they want. So it's nice for um, organizations. 
And then the idea was also to kind of make it easy to find anything you've made before and make it easy to create a folder and kind of, you know, start working directly within it. So you create the new folder or you find a folder you already ex that already exists and you just start adding media after you create it. So you just click that little um, plus button and start adding media from your camera roll. We're trying to think around more around security, just just as a consideration of like auto delete from camera roll after you know things like that. Really secure apps have like you you have to take the media within the app to make sure that it's not anywhere else on your phone and there's no copies and it doesn't get sent to iCloud, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we're prioritizing usability over privacy. So this is one of the trade offs where it's not going to be as secure if your phone gets confiscated. Your media will still be there in your camera roll even though it's on the server. And then you can choose a license. We ask these three questions here so that people can figure out what their license is without having to know what the licenses are. Yeah, um, yeah that, that was fun. I that's, love that's walking actually... through of the of entering metadata. Like yes, so cool. yeah. <laughs> and you can actually add little. You, I don't think we have a a screen for that. But once you add the the media, you then have a uh, location, people, notes, whatever. You can add whatever you want on top of that too within the app. And you can even do it by bulk. So what's cool is you can select a bunch of you know, files and like this. these are all from Edinburgh, which is a lovely place that I got to visit in the before times. And so I just grouped everything together and added the location and you can add notes and people and all that, you know, bulk. Um, and then once it's up, you can, you, oh, sorry, before it goes up, you can kind of see the progress and you can even reorder things. So if you have like a lot of big video files, you want to throw them at the bottom and reorganize them so that the little files go up first. So you get more up faster, things like that. Or you can delete them if you're like, oops, that was not supposed to be in this group. And so you can see what's happening um, by clicking this little circle. Where is it? Uh, up here. Gotcha. And then once you click that, you get to this screen where you can see everything that's going up. Once it's uploaded, it'll be grayed out. You know, if it's clear, it's kind of, or sorry, it'll be clear once it's uploaded, it'll be grayed out when it's in progress. So you have all these like tools, indicators to help you understand what's going on. Can you and know what got where? Files? You cannot, re okay, so yeah, so part of the verification process is that these long, stupid numbers yeah. um, actually are part of that hash. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes, that's something that is such a good question. Once it's on the server, you can do whatever you want with them. So once you see all the files, you can rename them, you can change them, whatever. But the nice thing is that these this piece of information is actually part of the verification piece. So even if you rename it, it's still in the metadata. That was my next question. Okay, yeah, yeah. cool. So like if you click on, so each one of these files, the JSON files has a bunch of the metadata in it. If you had proof mode, I wonder if I have an example of a proof mode. Um, no, this was, I think, all iPhone. But if you were using Android, there's also there'd also be a proof, which would add extra level of verification and metadata. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then you're working on that for the, yeah. I'm working on it for iOS. I'm just frustrated that I didn't include it here, but it's, there's, yeah, if you, if you go on the back end of the server, one folder, um, Oh, I forgot to mention that cool feature. Okay, so one folder will have like all this stuff in it. Mm -hmm. It will also have a folder for significant content if you flagged anything. So this little flag means that it gets routed to a subfolder. That's usually, it could be used as favorites or something you know innocuous, but it's usually for, for really um, violent or upsetting content that only certain people who are trained and capable of looking at it and managing it should be looking at. Gotcha. So that's why we have the significant content folder um separate so yeah so every piece of media gets uploaded with this extra json file yeah and a proof a proof mode file if if using for android so here's the hash i'm trying and here's the original file name so that's where it gets saved mm -hmm. even if you change the file name it'll still be here gotcha yeah um so yeah and it's annoying i know they're ugly looking file names <laughs> Yeah, it's typically uh, we we're very when we give tips on you know digital personal digital preservation. One of them is quality file naming. So that's just something to. Uh, yeah, I mean the fact that you can change it later is great, but. Um, yeah. yeah, it's annoying, but you know there's ways to automate all that. Yeah. The cool thing is the folders all are named for however you want, so you'll yeah. have an idea of what's in them. There's a <laughs> hierarchy because yeah, we're definitely all about the yeah the directory file directory structure too. So. Amia 19 and then all these different orgs.
Yeah, no, this is great. I mean, I feel like this could, your app, so your app could be used for like a community, like you said, community archiving, like if somebody wanted to create a collection on Internet Archive of like, you know, and do a, a surrounding an event, like upload your yeah. photos from this event. Yeah, like the Women's March or, okay. you know, it just, it just, you have to, the problem with activist media being uploaded on the Internet Archive, you really do have to be sensitive about who's in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like the ideal use case would just be like historical documents that people have in their homes that they're taking photos of or like something that helps expand the awareness of locales that's pretty innocuous and creating these like heavily localized historical collections collections. Right. That's a great use for this. Activists have their own servers that are using Save that they set up with Nextcloud. And I have a bunch of activist groups all over the world who are creating these localized collections with our support. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, what we're hoping is that our work pushes the standard in the, the corporate world to, in, in, you know, to it, include these features and this level of privacy so that Maybe someday we don't even have to exist. So everyone's doing this all the time, wherever they are. I don't see that happening because it detracts from the bottom line, which is all based on surveillance capitalism. So, you know, but yeah. Well, I'm so glad you do exist. <laughs> and I know you've been working so hard at this. I mean, I think it's been about 10 years since <laughs> I first met you and you were talking about this as a, an idea. <laughs> so it's so great to I see remember you. talking to Mark Toscano at at Orphan 7, was that the one in New York at SVA, about how mobile media is like our next frontier. And he was like, oh, there's so much analog to do. Why bother? I'm like, because we have to think about mobile. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's such other, a long it's going to be ago. another huge loss otherwise. You know, it's going to be like. People just assume that social media is an archive. They just assume that anything they have on their phone will be, exist forever. And like, it's almost more fragile because of this ubiquity of other places to put it that don't care about your media or the Absolutely. longevity. Absolutely, and there's just so much of it because everybody has it, you know, everyone has one. I mean, I got laughed at at the iSchool. They were like, well, what's the point of Facebook and Google files or photos or Flickr, you know, obviously that's where people should put their media. I was like, yeah, yeah let's talk now, people <laughs> yeah. laughing at me, who's laughing now? Well, that's what I'm saying now that I, I said earlier, I don't think you had joined us yet, but that, you know, the, the webinar that you did for us in February of 2019, beginning of 2019, like it's even more relevant now, you yeah. know, um, and, and what you're doing is even more relevant now. So, um, especially within the last year, I mean, I think people <laughs> are just so aware of the power of, um, documenting, um, you know, uh -huh. uh, Every, everything really, everything. You know, considering like police brutality and things like that with George Floyd and like- well, We have gone through, we, we are at a very scary point in our history as Americans and we need to take lessons. Since I have a background in international relations and citizen journalism and had written for indie media in the early aughts, I am very, very aware of the shifts of the world and I've studied fascist regimes extensively um for you know over 20 years so the canaries in the coal mine are my friends and it's been really tragic and horrifying to watch what's been happening and how digital communications have been co-opted um and so i think that i'm in a privileged position to be protected from some of this frontline uh these tragedies that have happened on the front lines and i've also been so personally affected by it that I have like a deep stake in it. And I, I think that this is something that we've been some, you know, people were able to just shut their eyes for a long time. Oh, elevator pitch description of same. Yeah, totally. Uh, Snowden. You don't see it in the app store. Oh no, we found oh, it. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. I just yeah. saw the chat's comments, but I think that having, um, I think understanding where we are in history is something that is really hard for people to do. And even with the blatant um, fascism that we were uh, unfortunately exposed to over the past number of years, I'm glad it was more blatant because that wasn't America's uh, way to go. Like they were really good at keeping this stuff covered up to the majority of people who weren't looking for the information. And now it's just, you can't turn away. You can't not have that conversation. You There is a reckoning right now and on many fronts. And so I think 
um, yeah, being prepared for that was, uh, you know, a little bit gratifying, but more sad. I was kind of hoping my tools would never be necessary. And right. unfortunately I was, yeah. you know, or only for a select few people. <laughs> mm -hmm. But no, yeah, everyone, uh, we it's all- a sad have... state of affairs and I'm sorry to bring everyone down, but we are well, and, well, and we're living through scary times. This is the thing that we do all have, um, you know, uh, activists in our community that um, we could bring your tool to, to them. Yeah. So as uh, you know, was asked, do you what would you say like is a one sentence kind of thing for for us to kind of go out to the public and say this is what save is about. I like that it's an acronym. So if we memorize that, we can kind of yeah. I mean, there's our tagline on the website, which is like fairly useful. But um, hang on one sec. Let me see if I can find anything that you can refer to because if I just spout something off, I feel like I'll want to change it anyway. <laughs> Hold on one sec. Where is it? Uh, hang on, I just had it up. Um, so <sighs> it's complex, right? So what we're advancing human rights to secure mobile media preservation, that is our tagline. Mm -hmm. But I think if you want to talk about save, here's some, here's some language. Um, yeah, there's, there's mm -hmm. like on the, on your website, I like how it says that save is a, you know, it's a mobile app that helps um, design. Yeah, to help citizen reporters and eyewitnesses around the world preserve, protect, authenticate, and amplify what they've documented. Yeah. Where's the chat? I can't even find anything. I'm so sorry. I feel I'm. I'm like. <laughs> it's probably the screen share. That's an old. Screen let share. me. Let me. I don't even. I, here we go. Okay. Um, I really think that. I think you can say it's a secure way to share your mobile media with with those who can make it count. So if you want to preserve it, you can do that. Um, if you want to make it, you know, if you want to send it to an organization um, that's collecting a lot of citizen mobile media, you can most likely do that. But again, it's hard because we don't provide a repository. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, and the, I think the main, one of the big selling points is the, you know, the encryption and the security, like the privacy too. Yeah. Um, that that um, it's, you know. We're trying to integrate with Signal. We're trying to figure out how to like integrate really well with platforms that a lot of people are already on to create some kind of, you know, mobile to private chat to repository. And this is where it's going to get really interesting with like the distributed web and all these like new kind of blockchain technologies. So stay tuned, that'll probably be a year or two out. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I think having a way to make it really easy for people to know that it's secure, that when they're using this thing, that they don't have to worry about someone intercepting them if they're being surveilled. They don't have to worry about it ending up somewhere where it can, either identity can be outed easily. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can also create these collections, which they can access and have full control over. I think, so I've been using a term narrative agency forever, and that's just having agency over your narrative. And I think that this really at the core of what this is, is it gives people the ability to share what they want, how they want with contextual information that helps other people understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's great. That's perfect. Mm. Sorry, that went on really long. No, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, are there any other? I know we we've kept you longer than I than I said, Natalie. So, um, it, are there any other questions for Natalie or about Save and also about the evaluation process of them picking uh, Nextcloud for for their cloud service? or anything, I know it's a, a lot of info. We should just rebrand as the anti-fascist app or the counter-propaganda <laughs> People would understand yeah. that, but then we'd be grouped with Antifa and oh God, yeah. I already live in an anarchist jurisdiction, what next? <laughs> yeah, I think it is absolutely a branding thing, like you said. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, thanks so much for coming. Yeah, well, yeah, thank you both for coming so much. Thank you, Natalie, for joining us today and um, really excited to just see how much SAVE has grown and is growing and all the great work that, that you're doing. So thank well, you. stay in touch. Reach out to me with any questions. I'm always available, happy to connect to other communities, um, all that. Great. Thanks, thank Jonathan. You.
And then also, um, yeah, if you want to share the either of these slides after I'll share you share everything after the 11th. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Then I'll give it to everyone on, on Slack. So 